Well, okay, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Okay, fantastic. So I just got to say, this is my first presentation in person since before March 2020. So we'll see how it goes. So I am Alex Lipka. Um, I'm an associate professor of biometry. I'm a statistician by training, but I do a lot of quantitative genetics and crops. And today, in this uh, approximately 15-minute presentation, I'm going to try to convince you all how the stuff we're doing is important for plant breeding. So first, I have about three introductory slides. Um, this slide was created by my uh, graduate student, Matt Murphy. And this is basically how I see my lab, the Lipka lab, fitting into uh, plant breeding. So a lot of um, money and resources is being put into high throughput genotypic data. So you know, you can measure the whole genome of, of, of like a crop species, right? And additionally, a whole lot of investment is being put into um, phenotypic data, you know, like, like flying drones over a field, high throughput phenotyping data and stuff like that. So what I see my lab as fitting into this whole mix is we do statistical G to P models, genotype to phenotype models. And so what that means is, you know, we use advanced statistical approaches to connect the genotype to the phenotype. So in greater detail, here's a slide uh, produced by another one of my graduate students, Sarah Widener. Um, we have the capability of um, ensuring that our investments into those high throughput genotyping and phenotypic technologies are going to give meaningful results. So what we do in a typical analysis in our lab is we will try out a GTP model. Um, we will run simulations and test them on real data from crops, and then we'll apply the model. So my third introductory slide, and then we'll start telling some stories about things we're doing. So the Lipka lab, we associate genotypes to phenotypes. The basic statistical model is our phenotypic trait is our y variable. Uh, one, one or more of them will be your y variables. And then your x variable is going to be one or more genomic markers. And so what we seek to do in our lab is develop models that are more accurate. And so we can measure that relationship between genotype and phenotype and more accurate genomic selection models. So what this all means is that um, this will help researchers dissect the genetic sources of agronomy, uh, agronomically important traits. So essentially, if we develop better statistical models, we will give our um, collaborators smaller haystacks in which to find genes in. And um, you know, we'll be able to run more flexible models that can capture a wider range of traits. And uh, genomic selection, which by the way, I'll provide a brief introduction later on this presentation. If we develop more accurate genomic selection models, this can result in a reduction in the breeding cycle. So the first story I'm going to tell you about that I'm really interested in, and I think can have potential um, important plant breeding applications, is the search for epistasis. And briefly, what I mean by epistasis is the interaction between genes, you know, their, their combined contribution to your birth value of the phenotypic trait. So when um, you search for biological epistasis, a typical study is that um, they'll do like a knockout mutation or something like that. And they'll find out that gene by gene interactions are important. So they will conclude that epistasis plays a major role in trait variability. Then me and my colleagues, if we do a search for statistical epistasis, you know, we will use arguably oversimplified statistical models, and we will conclude that epistasis is not important. Okay, so we have two subfields within the field of, you know, crop genetics, say, and they come to polar opposite conclusions on the importance of the interaction of the genes. I argue that this is a problem and there is a knowledge gap. So the hypothesis that we're looking into is that this disparity in opposing conclusions is because the statistical models are not up to the job. So what my lab is doing is we're looking into um, more advanced statistical models and seeing if they can help find these interacting genes. 
and making sure that they're applied to practice more. So, really briefly, here's one particular model we're trying. I'm not going to give a pop quiz on this, but you know, basically the underlying rationale is that you know there are multiple genes at a time and their interactions that collectively contribute to your trait, right? So usually statistical models test only one marker at a time. So we want to use a model that can include multiple markers at a time. So here our y variables are trait of interest, and then we'll do a statistical procedure to determine a set of markers as x variables that have a um, individual contribution to the trait. And then we'll have another set of pairs of markers that have an epistatic interaction effect. And then we have our grand mean random error term. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge they existed. So then we can do a statistical optimization procedure to choose which DNA genotypes to include as X variables. And we came up with a really silly name for this model. We decided to call it SPAML. So, um, Really quickly, I'm not going to brace the details of this results, but this picture is showing that SPAML is working, okay? So for each of these graphs, our x-axis is the effect size, is the contribution of a particular marker to a specific value. Um, and then a y-axis, you know, these are simulated traits. The y-axis is the proportion of times that SPAML was able to identify something, okay? So we're seeing that basically um, for, for these results that um, the blue lines are rising to the top and the blue bars are rising to the top. That means that this model searching for epistasis is working, okay? Moreover, these uh, results that I just circled here, these are showing that even if we're able to have a particular DNA marker that has an interaction effect and the main effect, um, sperm is able to distinguish between those two um, genetic signals. So what does this mean? Well, this means that spinal can pinpoint epistatic interactions and call them epistatic. So our original hypothesis is that the gap in disparity in the importance of epistasis is because of inadequate statistical models. Perhaps spinal is a good step in the right direction, but we don't know for sure. We're going to explore um, this um, landscape, if you will, of um, genetic diversity and uh, underlying genetic contributions to traits um, more, more extensively. And basically, we're going to try out spinal and other methods we're currently developing. And perhaps if, there, if we can conclude that epistasis is indeed very important, we can harness them in our statistical models and that could potentially lead for greater genetic gain in the field. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about, and this is actually the first time I'm ever presenting this ever, so this is totally brand new, and this is not my idea. So this is uh, some research that my uh, graduate student, Matt Murphy, we've already met him previously on this presentation, was looking into. And what he was looking into is finding markers that is associated with the variability of a particular trait. So. Let's say we're growing a whole bunch of corn, right? And let's say that our breeding objective is to have the general stability of our um, ear traits, okay, across our um, various lines. And moreover, let's say we um, want to plant them here in Urbana, or if we want to plant them in Texas, we want to have the same uniform stability in our observed traits. Well, if we develop statistical approaches for identifying markers that control that variability, we can achieve this. So, um, elaborating a little bit on um, controlling for the variance, there's a good side and there's a bad side. Um, the good side is that um, if you were to do the opposite and select for increased variability, Perhaps you could allow trait, allow particular plants to thrive in many novel environments. And my understanding of the process of decanalization is that that's precisely what happens during the domestication process of teosinte to maize. Like, basically, they were inadvertently um, selecting for increased variability, thus leading from, you know, T teosinte, which is on the far left, to 
elite May's lives, which I believe that is um, on the right. Now, the bad side is that if you select for too narrow a variability and you have an off field season, you might get a result that, that um, a, a resulting maze here on that left where it, you know, it just doesn't look good. So, VKT analysis helps us identify variance controlling real side. So, really quickly, um, Matt did a simulation study, and here's some results. Um, the take home message is on top, but briefly, all of these graphs, our x axis, is the effect size of a variance QTL, and then our y axis is our detection rate of these variance QTL using a statistical approach highlighted in blue and a statistical approach highlighted in red. So, what we're seeing is that at these various settings, we have vastly different detection rates. And what all of these results boil down to is that one, you need a really large sample size to be able to look for variance QTLs, you know, for the statistical purpose to behave optimally. Also, the, um, the distribution of um, alleles is going to be really important too. So, if you have more of like a 50 50 distribution of alleles, then um, this approach will perform better. So, what this means for plant breeding. If we can have more widespread implementation of this VQTL analysis, perhaps it can help plant breeders control and select for a novel sources of um, variability. So I'm going to give an extremely brief one slight introduction to genomic selection to talk about my very last project. Um, so genomic selection. So you start off with a training population. Um, that is genotyped and phenotyped um, with your markers of interest, your traits of interest. You use this training population to train a genomic selection model. Your Y variables, your traits, your X variables are all the genome wide markers. So then we go into some breeding material that's only genotyped with the exact same markers, and you basically plug and chug those marker values into this um, genomic selection model. You can obtain genomic estimated breeding values of your, um, of your phenotypes, right? And then you can make selections based off of these predicted genomic estimated breeding values. So what this means is that you're able to predict breeding values using markers. This means you can, you know, do selection right now today without having to wait an entire field season to get your phenotypes. And because of that, genomic selection can speed up the breeding cycle. So, putting on my statistician hat, there are many different genomic selection models used. Um, a lot of, most of them produce approximately the same results. So, really quickly, this is a standard um, model. And, um, okay, I'll just, I'll just go over it really quickly. A Y variable is our trait. And then if we have key markers throughout the genome, those are all included in the model. And then, of course, we have our error term and our intercept, okay? And the way the statistical mechanics of this model works is that basically the prediction of the effect size of your markers, this beta k, is, is restricted to be certain, between certain values. Okay, so this restriction is a penalty we can think of it. So this penalty we hypothesize could underestimate the impact of large effect genes. And consequently, we were wondering, does this restriction in values result in a suboptimal performance of our genomic selection model? So here's um, some analyses that my um, graduate student, Brian Rice, who was just offended, so Dr. Rice has conducted. Uh, we wanted to compare the predictability of the traditional model that I showed you in the previous slide versus a model that also includes a couple more statistical bells and whistles that account for these large effect genes. And so we did a simulation study, um, and we hypothesized that if we account for these large effect genes in our model, we would see an increased prediction accuracy. This picture over here, one example result is showing us that we're not seeing this. Our x-axis is our number of fixed effects that are included in the model, um, the, the, the number of large effect genes we're accounting for. And then our y-axis is our increase over the standard model. Now, I drew a arrow, um, a horizontal arrow at a y-coordinate of zero. 
And note how most of the dots and all that stuff are below zero. So what that is saying is that more often than not, for this particular result, we are seeing a worse performance when we account for these artifact genes than when we don't. Okay? So what this means for plant breeding? This approach of accounting for um, larger fed genes, indeed, it is very helpful for certain situations. It is not a blank check guarantee that you're always going to get an increase in your prediction accuracies. So in some situations, we might be better off using a traditional genomic selection model. Okay, and um, my time is up, so um, I'll, I'll be happy to take a question.